and I think I'll begin. Hi, everyone. I'm Karen McNeil. I'm the author of The Wine Bible and the editor of the digital newsletter Wine Speed. And this is episode number six of the extraordinary wines of Oakville in the heart of the Napa Valley. Thank you for being here. If you've joined us for any of the other Oakville episodes, you know that um, we have a lot of fun doing these. Um, so if you've joined us before, thank you. And if this is your first time, you are uh, absolutely in for a treat. And today, I'm glad to say that of the three wines um, we are featuring, and three different wineries, of course, two of those wines are white. And while Oakville is, of course, deservedly renowned for its Cabernets, there are also some very special white wines made in the Appalachian as well, um, and very special white wine vineyards, including the oldest Sauvignon Blanc vineyard um, in California, which probably means it's the oldest Sauvignon Blanc vineyard in the United States and may in, well indeed be in the entire new world. We'll talk about that in just a bit. Let me tell you who's here with me and, um, and then we'll take a quick look at a map. Mark Devere is a master of wine, um, meaning he passed the MW exam and does all kinds of things for the Robert Mongavi Winery and is uh, their lead educator. Tom Gamble is the owner of Gamble Family Vineyards. And Sean Capio is the president and winemaker for O'Shaughnessy Estate. So thank you, gentlemen, for being here. Um, Indeed, let, let us take a, we've, we've always done this, but it's helpful, I think, in terms of context. Let's take a, a quick look, if we could put our map up so we could just see where we are. Here you um, see outlined in green, the Oakville Appalachian in, um, in the heart of the Napa Valley. And you can see that it spans both sides of the valley, it goes from the Mayacamas on the west or on your left hand side to the Baca mountain range on the right hand side of the screen. And there you see Highway 29 bisecting um, the Appalachian running north and south. The Robert Mondavi Winery, um, we were sort of telescoping down to it right there where the little hand is. And we're going to be tasting their estate Fumé Blanc Reserve from part of their Tocalon Vineyard, again, where the hand is, on the Mayacamas, um, or western side of the Appalachian. And then we'll go down to the Gamble family, just going south a little bit to their home ranch, tucked uh, right there, right, you see it right below uh, Cardinal, and relatively close to the Napa River there. And then over to um, heading east to O'Shaughnessy, we'll be tasting their Chardonnay. And there you see it um, across the street, essentially, from uh, Groff, actually across a lane, really, from, from Groff, right on the famous Oakville crossroad right there. So, um, Thank you for showing us that, that map. That's helpful in terms of context. So gentlemen, we'll, get, um, we'll uh, look at or talk about your histories in a minute, but I first wanted to ask this question. And I, as I was thinking about these wines the other day, I, I realized that one of the hallmarks of Oakville in general, and that something you hear people say all the time, is that the wines are really balanced, that they have this beautiful balance. And of course, balance is an attribute that one looks for in every variety. It doesn't matter if it's Chardonnay, Sauvignon Blanc, Merlot, Cabernet, in every variety, right? In every wine. So my question to all of you is in a few sentences, what is balance exactly? Sean, what would you say? <laughs> Pick me first. Uh, so balance, I mean, we get to see uh, wines from three different appellations. So we grow on Howe Mountain, Mount Veter, and Oakville. And definitely when we look at the Cabernets on the mountain vineyards, we're always dealing with these really raw tannins. And it, it's a challenge for us to really uh, 
um, manage those wines to get good tannins out of them or to, to keep the tannins from being too aggressive and find that balance that's, that's inherent to the vineyard. Whereas in Oakville, on the Cabernet that we grow in Oakville, obviously we're tasting Chardonnay today, so balance in Chardonnay is a little different, but on the, at least for the Cabernet, we, we find that balance sort of is, is, um, is present uh, in its natural state. So we don't have to really uh, be too um, careful with how our extractions, our macerations go to get the balance out of Oakville. It sort of is a natural presence in the wines and, and we get this beautiful, lovely, silky texture out of the wines, which we love. But what is it? What is it? Mark, what would you say it is? Well, I, there's a, many ways to answer this, of course. So I think when people talk about balance in wines, they're often talking about the internal balance and how all the elements uh, counter each other and harmonize with each other. I think something that springs to mind when people, to your comment that people say Oakville has balance, it's almost like a contextual balance. I think relative to other areas, one of the things we love about Oakville is it's the balance point. And I think to, to Sean's point about the tannins, mm. it's a part of the valley where you can get lots of tannins, but gentle tannins at the same time. And it's a, a point of the valley or a point of the place in the world where you can get ripeness and yet not overripeness. You can get richness and yet brightness and freshness. So it's like a Oakville hits a balancing point of course, everywhere in the valley makes balance, or you can make balanced wines, but there's something about the way the elements ripen in Oakville that is a balanced point. Hmm. Okay, and, and Tom, your thought? Uh, in one word, integration. Uh, and it's just, but what allows the fruit to integrate with all those points that Mark just made is its location. Napa Valley as a whole is blessed to be in a wonderful location. And Oakville itself is, its southern edge is the exact center north and south of the mm -hmm. valley. And I think it's, um, it, it's uh, Napa Valley has great weather, but it somehow just harmonizes in, in, in Oakville. It, the, there's a gap in the Mayacamas to the west that allows uh, a lot of that westerly Pacific marine layer air to come in during the growing season that moderates the more northerly extremes of the heat. And it's also, so it's, it's very Goldilocks. It's not too warm and it's mm. not too cool. And all of that integrates into making it a wonderful uh, growing area. It's one of the earliest growing areas in Napa Valley, I think, uh, for uh, that reason. It was just such a nice climate. Mm. And, and then uh, Napa Valley has 50% of the world's soil series and uh, or, or soil orders, and then 33 of the soil series. And of those soil series, uh, we have at least half of those soil series in Oakville, which I think is just a textual el element that starts to add to that integration and adding yeah, so to what Mark and Sean were saying. Yeah. And it is, of course, a very tiny Appalachian, just yes, um, about five miles wide and, and two miles north to south. You know, I can say from a journalist perspective, um, we know that a wine that's not balanced is much easier to write about and talk about than a wine that is. Um, so forgive me for giving you the hard question, right? Because I know even for myself, when a wine is so spherical, so harmonious, so um, integrated to use your word, Tom, that you sort of want to throw up your hands and say, okay, I have nothing to say. It's perfect. I mean, it's much easier to write a whole paragraph about a terrible wine than it is about um, a beautifully balanced one. Well, let's get, let's get into some history here. And Mark, I want to start with you. Um, now, Robert Mondavi Winery may well be, um, let me, sorry, interrupt myself and remind everyone that we will be taking questions and you have a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Um, uh, so we hope you will use that. But um, Mark, back to you. The, um, the Robert Mondavi Winery is probably maybe the very best known winery in the United States in terms of its history. And, and it has a long history, a complex history. I was thinking that rather than telling us the history of the winery, um, because it is fairly well known, 
perhaps you could tell us a little bit about Robert Mondavi himself. Um, he's a legendary, uh, was a legendary person. You knew him well, I knew him well. Um, Tom and Sean knew him. Um, but give us a little background about him and why, why he was um, both a mentor and important to you. Well, uh, yes, yeah, so to tie it into my story, I suppose, you could, everyone who hasn't met me before has probably worked out by now, I'm, I'm not a Napa Valley native. I grew up in the UK, and when I first moved to Napa Valley in early 1997, I thought it was for a six-month summer job. And I sometimes people say, well, why did you stay? And I said, have you seen Napa Valley for a start? But more important than that, to your point, Karen, is I, I was working at Robert Mondavi Winery and I fell, as it were, under the, the spell of Mr. Mondavi. And, and I think anybody who met him and certainly everybody who was working at Robert Mondavi Winery at the time was so under the, the, the spell of his passion, his enthusiasm, his vision. And his, his, uh, he had that brilliant uh, balance, I suppose, of being a visionary, but always trying to make that vision come true and taking, uh, always uh, wanting to not only elevate what we were doing, but to promote Napa and to promote Oakville in particular. And so I, th I think my, the, the reason that I fell in love with Napa, the reason I fell in love with Robert Mondavi Winery was Miss Mondavi's vision and that, that amazing vision to which today we can sort of take for granted. And you kindly point out Robert Mondavi Winery is so well known. But when Miss Mondavi founded the winery in 1966, people thought he was crazy to say we can have a winery and focus on wines in the company of the great wines of the world and we want to make world-class wines in Napa and 55 years ago that was a slightly eccentric vision to have these days it's come to pass and of course many people have joined in and and, and helped put Napa Valley on the map but I think many people would credit Robert Mondavi with Certainly. inspiring a lot of people and he would always encourage he would always support people anybody who wanted to make great wine in napa he would encourage them he'd lend equipment he'd lend grapes he'd lend money he'd lend advice all the research we did he would share it so that everybody could rise in the industry and i think it's that passion and that spirit that has uh, has left such a great legacy and that's certainly what inspires me and that's that that's that, that's the passion that i have when i come to work and when i come to talk about the wines of oakville in particular yes uh, i i will say that um as a young journalist he once said to me and i was this was a many years ago um i had come out from new york and and he said now young woman i want you to know or young girl might he might have even said i want you to know great wine does not knock your socks off it slips them off slowly <laughs> and i will you know he was full of quotes like that yeah. tom your, um, your history your family's history goes back a long time um to 1917 um you've had generations now of farming in the napa valley tell me a little bit about uh G gamble family and how you went from farming to actually founding a winery, because I know that was something that you initiated. Yes, it was. The, um, I was the, to, to go from farming to, at, to the winery was really about, uh, one, I really liked wine, and uh, I also, and I saw that uh, the next generation, uh, they might not think that tractors were as cool as I did. And, um, but, and also, and, and there's a purely economic reason. And, and that is uh, to uh, make yourself more sustainable. Um, if you're mm -hmm. a farmer and sure. uh, there are farmers out there who uh, might be struggling right now, um, I have, from a pure commodity standpoint, you can turn a perishable crop into something that maybe you don't want it sitting in your inventory for that long, but at least you have it and can uh, uh, recoup at a later date. So there was a very practical reason. And um, love of the land, I think, 
inspires uh, me the most and why our family has been here for so many generations and to make it more sustainable, not only economically, but uh, to do good things and care for the earth in a way that is, uh, helps perpetuate your uh, economic activity. That's what drives us. And that seems to be an overarching passion in my family from generation to generation. And as the younger generation, the oldest ones are starting to ex, uh, exit their uh, hormonal trials. We'll see where they uh, uh, come out and what their, uh, their passion in life becomes. But I hope that by building uh, the winery, they want to sustain uh, uh, a life and the land which has sustained us for so many generations. Yeah, nicely said. Um, and Sean um, O'Shaughnessy is, of course, owned by Betty O'Shaughnessy and Paul Wolves, who are both real characters. Betty is just quite a, an amazing woman, um, a powerhouse, all four foot nine of her or whatever, um, however tall she is. Um, and I, I know that you've been with them, I think, since um, pretty much the beginning. Tell us about the founding of O'Shaughnessy. Yeah. I've been with him for 20 years now, so since the very beginning, you know, I feel real privileged to, to be at a property for that long, you know, and, and, and see everything through. But Betty, you know, arrived in Napa in the early 80s, and she bought her first property, was the Oakville property, and that's where her home is. And um, she spent uh, about, you know, 10 years being a part-time resident from, she was originally from Minneapolis, Minnesota. And um, when, she, when she bought the property in Oakville, there were grapes planted. They're not the same grapes we have planted today, but they were grapes planted and became a farmer, you know, sort of instantly. And then after about, about 10 years of uh, being a part-time uh, visitor in Napa Valley, uh, she um, got bit by the wine bug. You know, she didn't want to just be a grower anymore. She wanted to be a winery owner. And she found a property up here in Howe Mountain. That's where I'm, I am today uh, from, at the Howe Mountain Winery. And purchased this property in 96 uh, and uh, started clearing the property so nothing was here. And then we developed vineyards. Uh, I came on board in 99 and, and we started developing vineyards and building the winery. And, and our first uh, O'Shaughnessy vintage was in 2000. Well, I know there were bears there actually. Um, <laughs> Be Betty has told me there were bears there. And I think you've told me we that. Have, we have well. three, three uh, vineyards. One's called, uh, yeah. They're well, still around. One of the vineyards is called Rancho Del Oso. So, so Ranch of the Bear. <laughs> exactly. Let's start in and um, with our tasting. And as I was mentioning earlier, I'm so excited. I, I uh, love white wine and I drink a lot of white wine. And um, it always bothers me when I think that white wine isn't given the kind of gravitas that um, it deserves. And so I'm so happy that today we have two really quite extraordinary white wines. And Mark, we're going to start with the Mondavi Fumé Blanc. This um, is, of course, Sauvignon Blanc. Um, you can tell the story of Robert Mondavi calling it uh, Fumé Blanc. But, but also, please tell us, this is an old, from an old vineyard, right? Uh, so, yes. So I'll start with, so I think you can all see the bottle. I think it's Thank lined you. up there. So this is our reserve Fumé Blanc, which is from the Tokolon Vineyard. And as you're referring to, Karen, I think everybody on this call will know that Fumé Blanc is an alternative name for Sauvignon Blanc. And what some people forget, though, is that Robert Mondavi invented the name Fumé Blanc, basically. And it goes back to the, the foundation of Robert Mondavi Winery, when he wanted to raise the quality of wines being made in California and in Napa, and raise the reputation. Historically, in California, Sauvignon Blanc was mostly made as a sweet wine and considered a low quality wine. So I think consumer expectations, if the bottle said Sauvignon Blanc, that means it's going to be cheap and sweet. Bob wanted to make a dry, high quality wine. So in 1966, he made a dry, high quality wine and then basically had to find a way to bring it to market. And instead of trademarking the name, he, he came up with a, an alternative name for the variety. And so he was inspired by the wines of the Loire Valley, although very mm -hmm. different stylistically from what we make in Napa Valley. And in Puy Fume, they often call the grape, or in, that, in those days he had heard it referred to there as Blanc Fume. So he just turned that around, came up with Fume Blanc. As I say, he didn't trademark it or copyright it because he wanted anybody to be able to join in and, and, and make great wines with him. And so he had the ATF in those days, uh, TTB, 
register Fumé Blanc as a legal synonym for the Sauvignon Blanc grape. Yeah, and um, it should, uh, uh, I shouldn't miss saying that the quality of Napa Valley Sauvignon Blanc in the last, especially the last eight to 10 years has just skyrocketed. I mean, Mondavi has been known for this wine for a very long time, but um, Mondavi is now joined by many, many other producers making just exquisite Sauvignon Blancs. I, I call them super Sauvignons actually, um, because they come from premier vineyards, and they are um, treated in the vineyard and in the winery with every bit of um, the same kind of maniacal focus that Chardonnay and Cabernet often receive. So um, good for you. I'm a big Sauvignon Blanc um, fan. And lastly, before we go to Sean's Chardonnay, I want to say that I believe in 1966, uh, people forget that, I mean, Napa Valley was still very much the hinterlands and wines um, didn't cost what they cost today. The average Cabernet was about $1.50 a bottle and Bob Mondavi shocked the world by charging $1.79 for this wine, right? It was a big price back then. Yeah, yes indeed. And yep. I think your comments earlier, you were commenting earlier how, well let me put it another way, great white wines are maybe a, an amazing value proposition compared to the great red wines of Napa. You can get some of the great white wines. I think the beauty of Sauvignon Blanc, as you said, more and more people are making beautiful Sauvignon Blancs in Napa. Some people have this idea, and, and I think driven by maybe the Loire, New Zealand has sort of taken over, mm -hmm. uh, in some <laughs> ways, conceptual ownership of the Sauvignon Blanc variety. And they think it's a cool climate variety because of that. But I think it works beautifully in Napa because it can ripen really well and yet in the, in the climate in Napa, certainly in, in Oakville, it gets really beautiful, ripe flavors and yet retains an amazing acidity. Mm. So if you're, if you're tasting the, the Fumé Blanc Reserve along with us, it's clearly the opposite end of the spectrum in some ways from a Marlborough Sauvignon Blanc. This is not a, a grassy style. It's not delicate, light, uh, exuberant aromas. When Sauvignon Blanc ripens in, in this vineyard, in the Tokolon vineyard in particular, it ripens into what the, the Bordelais might refer to as the noble flavor spectrum of Sauvignon Blanc, which is more of the stone fruit, the white peach, the nectarine characters. And yet it gets this combination of ripe fruit flavors and yet always racy natural acidity. And I know we're not gonna get too technical here, but this fruit always comes in from the vineyard with a, a pH of about 2.9. So really strong backbone of natural acidity, which gives it this, this beautiful tension and brightness. Mm, love that word racy too. It's a, such a good word for great white wine and, and great uh, Fumé Blanc in particular. Um, and of course you can love uh, Sauvignon Blanc and love Chardonnay at the same time. They're so different um, in character. Sean, let's go to the O'Shaughnessy. And, you know, I, I meant to say earlier that um, anyone who has joined us before knows that I always want everyone to taste all the wines. So all of these guys have everyone's uh, wines. So feel, uh, please feel free to comment on each other's wines as well. But you just can't say anything bad. That's the only rule. Um, Sean, um, your, tell us about your Chardonnay, the, the, thank you, the O'Shaughnessy Chardonnay. Shameless product, Sean. Yeah, so Chardonnay for us is a relatively new wine, um, you know, we're primarily a Cabernet. And uh, we, um, we had some uh, acreage in the back of uh, the property in Oakville, about three acres, so we cleared out some old Merlot that was it was, wasn't performing very well. And uh, we planted Chardonnay and, and we, we decided to plant Chardonnay because we, often we go to these events and we do winemaker dinners and we, we pair several courses and we, you know, of, of wines and, and we make uh, you know, Merlot and we make Cabernet and we make some other varietals. But we didn't have a white wine varietal and, and Betty really loved Chardonnay. And she said, well, why don't we try planting some Chardonnay in Oakville? And I said, that's a great idea, Betty. And so we, we really looked at um, what we wanted to have in a wine. And so we wanted to make a wine that was more, that had more of this energy in it, as we talk about energy and, and texture, and not necessarily one of these more heavyweight Chardonnay. So 
Napa Valley being uh, a warmer climate, you know, more suited for, for the Bordeaux varietals uh, rather than the Burgundy varietals. So we, we had to make some, some choices in the vineyard. So first choices we made were to pick the uh, uh, clonal material. So uh, we picked uh, uh, a couple of these Mousquet clones. They, have, they offer more of these tropical fruit flavors. So we thought we'd give an uplift to the palate and to the aromas. And then the other half of the vineyard is, is the classic uh, old Wente clone, which, which you find pretty much uh, in, in a lot of the higher end vineyards in California. And then we did a very dense planting. So we're four by six in our vineyard. So it's a really tight space vineyard. It's just a single, uh, single cane um, uh, vineyard, so low yields. And uh, um, the, the, uh, the, the balance of all that, the, the clonal material, the, the spacing, the, the soil type that we have there. So we're in, we're in an old or a younger alluvial fan back there. Uh, between, there's a little canyon between a uh, little north of Dollyval and Pritchard Hill, between Dollyval and Pritchard Hill, where we have this, uh, this uh, canyon that washed out in this, the soils into our, our vineyard. And it's actually a nice, nice soil type. There is some clay in that soil type, but there's also nice uh, um, pebbly stones and stuff. So we have a great balance in the vineyard. And, and when we picked the, the, the grape is a big uh, part of um, the style that we've created. We're, we're a non-malolactic style, so we're not, we're not promoting any of the, uh, the malic acid, which creates a, a richer tone. We wanted more of that energy and acid in the grape. Yeah, and um, energy is such a good word. Um, all wines need, in my opinion, a sense of aliveness. But, um, you know, sometimes it can be hard with Chardonnay, right? Because Chardonnay, People look to it for this languorous, very round sense, and yet that quickly can get um, kind of boring on the palate if you don't have a little, you know, a little verb in there as well. Um, so what I really like about this wine is, in the same split second, it is very um, flushed and languorous, but it is, as you say, sometimes the word people use is bright. It's bright and has some right. vivacity at the same time. Yeah, we love we love making this wine. It's a lot of fun, and we we do some stuff in the winery. So we're not, you know, I used to I used to work at Peter Michael Winery, and we did a lot. You know, it was all 100% new oak, you know, a ton of malolactic, stirring the leaves, and so we're sort of the opposite end of the spectrum. We we ferment in concrete, we ferment in stainless steel, and then uh, and then a very small percentage of new oak. Uh, most of it's neutral. We're doing a little bit of lee stirring. So we're really sort of crafting this wine to create this, this style. And we just sort of love how, how the balance. It's taken us a few years to figure out the, the exact proportions of everything. Um, but we're, we're really pleased. And this is the 20, 2018 vintage. Mm -hmm. uh, and 2018 was a great year for us. You know, it was a very cool year. So this is the latest um, harvest date that we've had for our Chardonnay. So we had a lot of hang time in there and just developed some really wonderful tropical flavors in this wine. Yeah, it's a delicious, luscious wine. Really <laughs> exciting on the palate. <coughs> Amazing flavors. <coughs> Pardon me. And Tom, we're going to go to your Cabernet. It probably, oh, sorry. It probably um, is unusual to be the only Cabernet on the, in the tasting here. But here you are. Um, so let's taste your wine together. This is your family, from your family home vineyard. And give us your thoughts about um, how this wine is tasting to you today. This is your 2015 Cabernet. Excuse me. Uh, 2015 was a small, uh, a, a small uh, crop yield after uh, several generous vintages as far as uh, yield. And we, we were rewarded with um, intense flavors. And um, we tend to be a more dialed back uh, a winery where uh, we started the whole conversation with balance and balance is important uh, uh, to us. I grew up with uh, wines from the Napa Valley that were more dialed back and needed more aging than they do today. And that was due to many factors, but that's what I think set my palate. And then I, I hired, um, uh, I hired a, a Brit to uh, make my wines, and so and he uh, grew up uh, uh, tasting his parents' wines that had arrived uh, in in the boot of their car on vacations. So we had we have very similar palates, 
and we uh, set out to make a wine that was both accessible in its youth, but had great aging potential. We think we have that in this wine. I think that the, the, the tannins are round, the, uh, the fruits are really, I'm getting um, uh, such, uh, it, it, it's weird to say th certain things, but I, I taste the sun and, and the rock and that this is a very exposed vineyard on a knoll top of volcanic soils uh, uh, that uh, piled up in that massive uh, slide that Sean mentioned in geologic times. And uh, it has a northwest exposure and a southeast exposure. And we, uh, we, we look to, um, uh, uh, and it can be extremely uh, tannic, uh, but, and, and if you let it ripen uh, too much, it can be, uh, perhaps you will lose the balance of, of uh, the natural acidity. So we pick multiple times uh, to have an early pick that may give you uh, some of those uh, 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 Cabernet varietal uh, qualities and almost uh, uh, you know, the green teas and the tobacco leaves. Uh, but you also, right now, what it's hitting me in the nose uh, is uh, the sun ripened uh, raspberries and, and I always call it blackberry bramble because I grew up around blackberries and it's not really the berry itself. It's the bramble, the desiccated flower almost that uh, came with it. And there mm. are, and there's, there's just this hint of a star anise in it. And, and, it, and, and its cousin uh, fennel and anise grows in the creek beds nearby. And it just reminds me almost of, of being a boy in the valley and, and uh, those smells that just permeate you during the summertime romp. Uh, there's a little vanilla bean that I get um, as uh, on the back and as it's, it's, it's gestating uh, back there. I'm going to have to watch out, Tom, because that, that was pretty poetic. I mean, um, I'm going to have to watch out if you ever decide to be a wine writer. I don't know. Oh God! Berries, that, sun on a wall. That's rock wall. That's pretty good. Wall. There. Well, thank you. Thank yeah, you. Very good. And there's but hope I, for I me. If I all go down in flames here. Okay, good. Um, but I know exactly what you mean. That um, you know, I think it's why we all love to walk in a wine region is because yeah. not just to see the vineyards but to smell all the other smells. And people forget that the Napa Valley is ringed uh, by other vegetation, by old, dry California forests. And some of those smells show up in the wine and it's really lovely. Um, we've got several questions coming in and um, Mark, this qu first question is for you. Um, this is a great question um, from uh, Kristen Austin who's saying, Assuming that Bordeaux red varieties work well in Napa and in Oakville in particular, why didn't Mondavi and early Napa wineries also plant Semillon and Muscadel, then blend it with Sauvignon Blanc in the manner of white Bordeaux? Well, we did. So the, uh, <laughs> uh, but in, maybe in a slightly different proportion. Uh, but the, but so I'll answer that in two ways. First of all, we we do have Semillon, and I didn't get into the technical details. This bottling, the fifteen, is about six percent Semillon, and so the the Fumé Blanc, our Napa Valley Fumé Blanc, and our Reserve Fumé Blanc usually has and it ranges between five percent and fifteen percent, typically of Semillon mm. in the blend. So first of all, we do. What we like about it is that. What I the way I describe it is it complements the texture of the Sauvignon Blanc, but it doesn't fight against the freshness. So it gives a sort of waxiness and a complexity mm. and adds to the aromatic characters, a slightly sort of apple-y character that we don't get in the Sauvignon Blanc, but it's definitely an important blending tool. If the question is why isn't the balance the other way around? A lot of the great 
white wines mm. of Bordeaux maybe have more Semillon and less Sauvignon Blanc in, in, in the balance. I think what I see is back to the, the comment I made earlier, I think Sauvignon Blanc seems to hold its freshness a little bit better in that maybe the, the hotter days that we have, slightly hotter than the, the, the Grave region or the great regions of Bordeaux, Sauvignon Blanc holds its freshness beautifully. It holds its national, natural acidity beautifully. Semillon, uh, while, while getting the richness and that those uh, ex intense, uh, expressive flavors, the best Semillon we have doesn't quite reach the heights of the best Sauvignon Blanc we have. So it's a good partner with the Sauvignon Blanc, but I wouldn't see it being the other way around. Yeah, yeah, nicely said. Um, and actually the percentage of Semillon is going down in Napa Valley. It's a very site-specific uh, variety, isn't it? And um, uh, I think it's safe to say that like Mondavi, a lot of the top Sauvignon Blanc producers do use just a little bit, but there isn't much to go around any longer. Um, the, here's another question coming in from uh, Deb Kennedy, who's asking, what changes do all of you see um, happening in your wineries and wineries in general going forward as a result of um, climate change? We are centered, Napa Valley is, is blessed as a bastion of creativity. And Oakville <laughs> is, uh, is a hyper concentration of uh, creativity. And I'd put it uh, this way to Deb, we have about 150 years of interrupted wine growing experience. There were these guys who um, were called the Romans and they were the first to plant Bordeaux. And uh, that was, so they have a thousand plus years of experience of one sort or another. We are still trying to learn all our microclimates and our soils and our interactions uh, with our soils. And I see one that the North Coast, uh, I've, I've perused 32 different uh, climate models and I'm doing my best efforts with advisors to, as I replant, to make adjustments in vine height, in, in rootstock uh, uh, choices and in, uh, and in cover crop decisions. And, and, and trellis design to uh, adapt to uh, a climate change. One, we're blessed with location where it's supposed to be a relatively mild climate, climate change. And uh, no one in any of these climate models, I think has accurately predicted what sea level change is going to do. Are we going to be a little bit closer to the bay as a result? Mm -hmm. And what is that going to ha have happen is, are the hotter inland areas actually going to create more convection and bring in more fog from the Pacific? That's right, Ocean. could happen. So it's, it's uh, we're trying to hedge our bets, but I grew up as a, as a farmer and um, I don't wanna be in a position where I have to write a sad country song. Um, about how it's all gone to H in a handbasket. So uh, we're, we're, we're trying different things. And I know that other growers and vintners are as, as, as well. And um, it's actually, while well, it's kind of scary in one way, it's also invigorating um, the energy around, gee whiz, maybe we get to rethink this uh, mm. uh, just a little mm. bit. Yeah. Nicely said. Well, and it is true that the Napa Valley as a whole has had um, uh, very um, aggressive climate um, plans and climate research for quite some time now. The first um, I recall uh, about this was maybe 20 years ago when the Napa Valley as a whole um, hired um, scientists from Stanford and Scripps to begin addressing the issues of climate change and what its potential impact um, might be. So I think the idea that the valley will be caught flat-footed or sleeping is, is unlikely. I know um, thinking about all the wineries who, like all of you, are um, very finely attuned to 
figuring out and doing a lot of research and attempting to figure out what, what paths might be open um, given what we don't know exactly is coming is, is, um, is significant. Um, let's see, um, we also have another question here um, about um, uh, innovation in terms of business practices. Um, hmm, this is a complex question here. Um, uh, and the example that this person has given, I'm sorry, it's from an anonymous um, person watching, saying that, um, are there business practices that might be frowned upon, but maybe would lead to commercial success? And the example they give is Cabernet aged in bourbon barrels. Hmm, I don't know. Um, any unusual business practices any of you can um, want to report? I like bourbon from bourbon barrels. <laughs> <laughs> that is just about the most perfect response. Yes, bourbon from bourbon barrels. I, 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 don't, I don't know if that's a questionable uh, practice and I'm not quite sure uh, what they're getting at by the question. So maybe Sean does or Mark, but I'll let you guys try. Uh, well, I, you know, I think there there certainly are, are different ways we can make wine in a in a more commercial fashion to make them appealing uh, to consumer mm. early on, rather than a traditional winemaking um, maceration program. You know, uh, so there are there are some some tricks that, that that can be played in the winery by certain you know uh, brands that maybe are trying uh, hitting in the lower end of the spectrum that. That, that we wouldn't see as traditional winemaking. That's, that's yeah. the only thing I can think of. Yeah. Let me take the conversation in a slightly different direction here. I, um, I want to talk about uh, an idea that I think does, again, transcend all varieties and that does seem to be a hallmark of Oakville. And that's the way wines feel, their texture. Um, when I watch people being excited about a wine, you know, they'll often say, oh, I, I like its cherry flavor or something. But you watch them taste it and you think, oh, it's the way it feels that they are really responding uh, to. I'm, I'm curious to know uh, whether um, the three of you put emphasis on, on texture in wine. Absolutely. I think it's a very important part of wine. And I think it's, some, again, back to where we started as what makes Oakville distinctive, mm. is it's a, 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 a characteristic that Oakville can give this beautiful texture, because texture isn't just about having a lot of texture, it's about the balance to that texture. And I think what Oaks, Oakville can bring to a wine is the, the, the ability to have texture, to have presence in the palate and yet not be heavy. And I think that's mm. part of the beauty of, uh, of growing grapes in Oakville. Buoyancy, Ooh, so nice. yeah. buoyancy on the palate is uh, meaning it's, it's not too cloying or it's not too sharp um, on the palate. It, it, it makes for uh, uh, wines that can go so well with food and not be exhausting when you're tasting them. I, we probably all had a very heavy wine that just kind of exhausts your desire to have another sip. And, and uh, uh, my, my wife is probably, and my winemaker are definitely stronger on aromas than I am, but I'm very strong on, on palate and the textural qualities are uh, what, really ex ex excites me uh, a, a, about a wine and all of these have uh, that energy but uh, you can have almost too much energy but all three of these wines just are um, on a relative basis refreshing I think. Mm. And Sean you are a winemaker and Chardonnay boy above all is just always thought of as such a textural mm -hmm. wine. Are you thinking about that when you are making this wine? For sure. Yeah, no, for sure. And that's, I think that's what makes you want to have that second sip, you know, is, is you can have great aromas and you can have great color and all these things, but when you get it into your palate and you, and you have that, that texture 
and and that balance. You know, we go back to that whole question of balance. And you know, for our for our Chardonnay, I think really what I what I love about this wine and what we really strive for is you have that bright acidity, but you have this sort of waxy texture to this wine, and you know this this interplay of of uh, richness but acidity. And, and if you can hit that that balance properly, it just it just sings. And I think that that's what this wine for me does. And I just want to drink it all day long. Yes, I think when you, you know, in a, the classic um, dinner party test, when you put some bottles in the center of the table and you watch what bottle gets emptied first, it is often the wine that just is effortless to drink and feels so good yeah. to drink. And on that note, how do you uh, judge that test, Karen? Because I always save the best till last, and so it's my least favorite that's finished first. <laughs> um, Mark, I don't know. You're too, have, you're uh, too intellectual, greater, Mark. You have a greater consumptive capacity than me. <laughs> I, I, or either that, or I'm, um, you know, not a delayed gratification kind of person. I'm just <laughs> going straight for um, what I love the best. Um, <laughs> And on that note, I want to thank all three of you um, for joining us today. It's really been fun. Tom Gamble, thank you so much. Mark DeVere from Robert Mondavi Winery. Sean Capio from O'Shaughnessy. And thank all of you for uh, joining us. We'll be um, doing episode seven next week of our Oakville series. I'm Karen McNeil once again. Um, I'm the author of the Wine Bible, which I hope you have and the editor of Wine Speed. It's free, so I hope you get it as well. And thanks so much for joining us. We'll see you again next week, episode seven of The Great Wines of Oakville. Thank you. <laughs>